This is Ed Weber from ToolWorks, and I'm going to start walking you through the presentation. Since we have a limited amount of time, I want to jump right into it. Uh, first thing I want to do is kind of just talk a little bit about the agenda of what we're going to be getting into. Uh, first, a little bit of introduction about ToolWorks and Rayco, how we got into this, how we work together. And then kind of jump right into what drives the traceability requirements, things that we need to understand in terms of traceability. And to kind of differentiate between the, the tracking and tracing, this is kind of an interchangeable terminology. We want to kind of talk about the two different words and how we differentiate them. Talk a little bit about the lot traceability objectives and benefits that you get from doing it. Uh, what kind of functions are being performed when you're actually doing any kind of lot traceability. Talk a, about a customer that Rayco and ToolWorks has worked with together to actually implement a lot track system. And then finally, go into a uh, kind of one slide. We'll talk about some implementation planning, something that's extremely critical to actually having success in doing a lot track system. So right off the bat, uh, a little bit about us. Uh, we have certainly been around uh, since 1997, not, uh, not a startup company. And uh, really, this, this is what we do. The whole traceability, error-proofing world, uh, the world we live in, this is our specialty. Uh, we've been involved in, in doing lot traceability for a very long time, and even we're involved in, in one case with the Protus Traceability Initiative, uh, where we sat on the technology working group that actually helped develop some of those labeling standards. And we are what is known as an independent software vendor, an ISV for Reco Industries. And just because we're, we're talking uh, quite a bit about the food side of the, of the world, uh, just give you a little bit of brief overview of here's some of the customers that we've worked with in the food industry and uh, some of the, the things we've done with them in terms of traceability. And now I'll turn it over to Larry to talk a little bit about Rayco. Well, thank you, Ed. Hi, I'm Larry Sherman. I'm the Solutions Architect at Rayco Interactive. Uh, also, I manage the ISV program, which Ed talked about with ToolWorks. We use the ISV program to extend Rayco Interactive's reach in areas that other partners have a core competency. And you'll hear from Ed today about ToolWorks' ability in the lot traceability and and recall management containment systems. Rayco Interactive also specializes in GPS fleet tracking, field service applications, specialized transportation delivery, yard management. We also have a custom development professional services group, and we really, really are good about cellular data services. If you need some help in these areas, feel free to reach out to Rayco Interactive. Back to you, Ed. Thanks, Larry. Okay. Uh, first thing is, I want to talk a little bit about some of the different uh, headlines and events, uh, and, and I, it was kind of an interesting process because I was doing some research to kind of come up with some relevant headlines, and I wasn't sure how far back I had to go when, when doing some of the uh, Googling on the Internet to see what kind of recalls have, have been around lately that people may or may not have heard of. And it was interesting because, um, of course, as, uh, as would have it, the, uh, I didn't really have to go past June. And so what you're looking at here, and just this is really just a sampling of some of the recalls that, that hit the, the world in, in June and here in the U.S. Uh, things like the hepatitis A outbreak uh, with frozen berries, sunflower seeds, pet food, uh, ground beef E. coli, and, and believe it or not, plastic inside chicken. So these are, these are some of the things. This, this is why it's so critical to have to address this issue because this is something that is happening all the time. And uh, the, certainly we've seen bigger headlines uh, over the years uh, with uh, spinach and tomatoes and, and different larger recalls that have kind of made the, uh, the headline news. But this is the kind of stuff that goes on behind the scenes all the time. And why is that? Because there are people involved. And anytime you have people involved in any kind of processing operation, uh, even if it's not food, then you're going to have the possibility of human error. And this is where the traceability requirements come in. And what this really is all about is, you know, certainly, you know, everybody focuses on the headlines, right? The, you know, the, what what's it going to mean to my company? But really, internally, it's 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 huge. Now, this was an actual survey that was done by the Grocery Manufacturers Association. They went to their membership and they surveyed about tw uh, 36 members. And we're talking about companies like Del Monte and Hershey's, Smuckers, Fresh Express, and basically they asked them, you know, what would the, what, you know, in terms of any recall they've had, uh, what was the actual financial impact internally? And what came back, I guess, is kind of looking at maybe a glass half full, half empty, right? I mean, the good news is that, you know, of the respondents, 48% said that their impact was less than $9 million. Now, you know, for maybe some of these bigger companies, that's not a huge amount, but still, you know, you're talking millions, not thousands. 
Uh, but the big news here is that the flip side, which is that 52% of the recalls actually cost $10 million and up, and in some cases over $100 million. So again, it's one of those scenarios where everybody hopes and thinks that they're not going to be the one to be impacted by this, that they're not going to have you know, recall. But the, the key here is understanding that if you do, there's a significant cost factor involved. Now, in terms of some of the outside drivers, it isn't just internally what, what it costs the company, but what really drives traceability, uh, a lot of it is government action. So it started really way back after 9-11 with the Bioterrorism Act, and uh, which was kind of you know, passed you know, quickly uh, within Congress because of concerns about safeguarding the, the food and water supply, the possibility of terrorists you know, doing anything in terms of contaminating that. And so the whole, some of those you know, traceability uh, initiatives were really developed back then through that act. And that followed in uh, just a few years ago with, from just in the produce side because there was so much bad press out there uh, within the produce industry, again, from well, some of that spinach and tomatoes and, and other uh, produce that were uh, causing people to be sick and in some cases causing death that the produce industry really wanted to get ahead of the curve. They wanted to be proactive, so they started developing standards within their industry to uh, basically enhance traceability. And that, of course, was followed up quickly with the Food Safety Modernization Act in 2011, which is still in process. A lot of people haven't heard much from it because it's actually still sitting within the FDA in terms of you know, releasing some of the uh, regulations and things like that, but it is something that is actually fast-tracking right now, and you're going to be certainly hearing more and more about that as time goes on. And of course, the, the biggest outside driver is customers, which have been basically uh, asking for these kinds of traceability systems forever, because the customers are depending where you sit in, in the queue. So if you are a grower, your customer, of course, is going to be a retailer. If you're a retailer, your customer is going to be consumers like ourselves. So these are some of the outside drivers that actually make the, the traceability come a front and center of process. Now, to kind of just look at from the standpoint of tracking and traceability, because these are words that are used uh, interchangeably uh, quite a bit. And although this is not a Webster's Dictionary definition, I call it the Weber's Dictionary definition, uh, because I like to look at it in terms of the tracking part as when I think of tracking, I think of more logistics focus. And these are uh, like maybe a, a grower who might be growing tomatoes and bringing them in and basically just boxing them up and shipping them out to a retailer or a distribution center. In their situation, because they're not really being consumed in a manufacturing process, they're mainly concerned on the receiving and shipping side. And so to me, that's more of a, you know, where you're just tracking items that are just moving, that are basically in motion, as opposed to traceability, where I consider it to be more manufacturing focused. And now those same tomatoes that are coming in are not just going back out as tomatoes to sit on a, to put on a grocery shelf, but rather are being used or consumed in a manufacturing process. So for example, they're being used to make a ready-made salad, or they may be used in soup, to make tomato soup. So you look at that, and now that process, yeah, you still have the receiving, you still have the shipping, but now you've got a very significant function in between, which is production. And that's where that traceability, being able to trace back through a chain is going to be critical to, in terms of traceability. So depending on where you fall, you might be looking at just tracking, using the tracking portion or the traceability side of, of lot. Now, regardless of whether you're talking about the tracking or tracing, the FDA kind of views it all as, as one of the same, meaning that if you know, you're in the middle and what they want is they want you to be able to trace one back and one forward. So you're going to have to be able to tell them who exactly supplied you with specific ingredients or components or, or product and then be able to, to go back and tell them, okay, where did those items, where did your finished items ship? So from the FDA perspective, whether you're doing production or not, you still have to be able to do this one up, one back process in terms of the traceability. Overall, what, uh, what happens when you're looking at traceability, you have certain objectives in mind. And one of the key objectives is to be able to shorten that lead time and be able to reduce the cost of identifying and notifying your customers of any kind of product recall scenario. Uh, but of course, <laughs> leading that isn't just about 
shortening and reducing, but it's really about reducing the number of products recalled. And that's really where the traceability kind of comes in and really shines, is the ability to limit that scope of a recall. The other side is, well, how about what are you going to do with, you know, once you, you know, look at the FDA side of things, they want that one up, one back. But really, there's more to it, because what about anything you already have in-house? Anything that, that might be in process or hasn't shipped yet, if you determine that you've got a problem with a certain ingredient in a, in a recipe, then you have to not only know where it's shipped to, but you also have to know what is still in-house that hasn't even been shipped yet. So quarantine is also a very critical objective for lot traceability. And of course, providing an audit trail for quality, because quality ultimately needs to understand you know, any kind of information about what has been produced and what, um, you know, where, where things have come and gone. So uh, having that audit trail is very important for traceability. Now, you look at automated traceability systems, you know, what benefits does that really bring? Well, over a manual process, okay, there's, there's your basic, okay, the more accurate data. We all know that by doing any kind of you know, barcoding systems, people have been working with that over the years, you realize that it's a lot of, uh, you know, accuracy that, that you're gaining when you're, when you're doing any kind of automation. Uh, in terms of, you know, being able to get that information more quickly, of course, you're also increasing the food safety chain. So that's it, also another importance because once you have a lot of data and you can mine that data, you can also get a lot of information out of that. The, of course, biggest thing, recall and quarantine data at the push of a button. So what you really want to be able to do is take all that information that you're gathering, be able to hit that one button, and be able to see exactly what happened in terms of the, the, the process that you use, the manufacturing process or the distribution process, and be able to see what you have on hand, be able to have all that information instantaneously. The FDA gives you 48 hours to provide this information. You can have it literally within minutes if you have an automated system. In terms of regulatory compliance, obviously, as I mentioned, you know, having the, uh, the FDA and other agencies that require this kind of um, regulations to, to provide this information to them is extremely critical and good for rep your reputation as well. Because what you're talking about ultimately is that brand protection. So you think about, you know, you're the ultimate end user customers and consumers who have a problem with something they purchased. Well, they think about, you know, where they got it from, right? I mean, this is the kind of thing if, if there is a, you know, some kind of food poisoning scenario that, that occurs then people think about where did they buy the food from. They're not necessarily thinking about, oh, wait a second, I wonder which grower down in Mexico or Chile, uh, you, know, per, you know, actually grew this, you know, head of lettuce that, that made me sick. What they're thinking about is, I just went to Kroger's, I went to Walmart, and I bought these, and that made me sick. I'm not going to shop there anymore because they have bad stuff. So this whole idea of brand protection, business reputation is, is, is critical, and that's really what, what drove this whole produce traceability initiative and what continues to drive traceability requirements throughout different industries. And of course, in a worst case scenario, as some of us remember from the, uh, uh, the hot dog manufacturing and, and some of the other uh, uh, problems that people have had through these recalls, if it's severe enough, significant enough, it can really drive you out of business. So having something in, in place to be able to uh, limit the scope of that recall is very critical. Now when you look at kind of how it works internally, there's, even though it kind of shows, you know, everything you talk from an ingredient lot, let's say from the, going from the right to the left, that these are, you know, items that are, you know, being actually made into some kind of finished good item, which in turn gets packed into a box, which in turn gets loaded on a pallet, which in turn gets allocated to a shipper, right? So you kind of follow that. But really what happens is it all, all boils down to what we call the parent-child connection. So every one of these steps involves a, a child, which is something that's introduced to a process that gets consumed, and then the parent, which is produced as a result of the process. And so at each part of the chain, you're always having this parent-child connection. And it's very easy for the parent of one operation to become the child of the next. So that all becomes that, that chain structure, and then what happens is as you start trying to do your analysis, you're going up and down that chain. And that's really what, the, what forms the basis of any good traceability system. So having that is very important. Understanding that parent-child connection is one of the key ingredients we'll talk about later of putting together a traceability system. 
Now, the specific system that we're working with, that we work with with RACO, is this what we call TW lot, and it's our lot traceability system, and it kind of has uh, can be very simplistic. And when we do provide this in a way where if somebody wanted to, literally what you see there on this on this picture is all you would need. You could have a computer and a keyboard and a mouse. And you could basically receive, you can produce, and you can ship. And all the reporting, the up and down the chain, that parent-child connection is all there for you. But in many cases, customers have more sophisticated requirements. And so we do also allow for the system to do different integration points, such as if you have an automated conveyor system where there are products going through a, uh, an automated process, we can provide fixed station cameras and scanners that can really identify items as they go by. So there's that part of it on the fixed scanner side. And then there's also the, the handheld terminal option where you can actually work with the system. You can have an operator standing there, an operator is looking at prompts on the screen, they're pulling the trigger, they're doing the scanning, they're doing, it could be for RFID, uh, identification, anything like that, and all that information will be, actually be more interactive with, with the person at that point. And then it can get really highly automated by actually tying in with PLCs, with actual machines. So quality data and um, you know the, the the heat uh, and the uh, torquing and and just you know any anything any kind of quality information at all any kind of temperatures things that that have to get recorded along with these parent child transactions can then also be pulled down through uh, these kind of automated systems so you see you can kind of have these different options now again you could also run just like this you don't have to tie in with any other system you can basically you know, sit here as a standalone system and be able to collect data you know, through any of these means. But again, a lot of customers have other information they want to tie in with. They want to either pull down data or push data back out to a different system. And so we do have the ability to communicate. And we can talk to other PC systems. Uh, we're all Microsoft-based, so we have a lot of flexibility. We can talk to you know, different mainframes and uh, mid-range systems. So Really, we, we do offer all these options. Again, you can run this in as simple as you want, totally standalone. You can put in automated data collection, and you can put in other system integration all at once. And it's just whatever level you'd like. Now, we look at what we did for an actual joint customer of ours. Um, we were working with a pet food bag manufacturer. Now, that was just the company doing an actual inner They were doing the inner liners of pet food bags, you know, when you kind of pull you know, part of the dog food bag, you see that little plastic uh, film that uh, that is the inner liner for the for the bag. This is a situation where they have a lot of chemicals that and a, and a, a very sophisticated manufacturing process that actually makes these inner liners. And if anything was to happen with that process where it was some chemical that that leaked into the uh, pet food itself once the bag was filled, then this could make a pet very sick. So, uh, this, this company has to be under uh, under the same kind of scrutiny as the company making the pet food itself. So they all had to get together and comply and come up with it with a uh, way of being able to uh, deal with the FDA regulations. And for a long time, they were maintaining all these records, these lot records, manually on paper. But it got to the point where I guess you know, good problem for them to have. Uh, their their growth exploded, and uh, manual tracking just wasn't feasible any longer. So Rayco had worked with us, and we not only put in our lot track system, that TW lot system, but we also, because of some unique reporting requirements that they had and some of the information that they were recording uh, because of some of those processes they had, that we were able to customize our software because, of course, we wrote it, we own it. And so we were able to uh, provide a, a customized set of prompts for them to actually uh, work with their operators on. And the nice thing is, once the uh, system was implemented, they soon afterwards had to actually go through a mock recall. And uh, when they did that, uh, literally what used to take them days to put together actually went down to minutes. So it was, a, it was an immediate payback for them and uh, something that they uh, you know, really needed to have in place, and, and they're very grateful to have in place if there's ever an actual recall. When you look at some of the pieces, uh, again, we, we did for this uh, particular customer, you look at the receiving side, 
And what we were able to do is some of their customers were providing, or suppliers, should say, were providing labels uh, on an incoming product, and some weren't. So what we put together for them was the ability to basically scan and, and actually produce new labels if it was necessary so that by the time they got through receiving, everything was labeled consistently across the board. Now, if you can get your suppliers to get on board with a common label standard, then this could be a very easy process. You can just scan the receive and you're all done. But um, in, in, the, in the case where, where you don't have that uh, ability to basically make your suppliers uh, put anything together that, that is you know, consistent across your standard, then our system will give you the ability to reprint those labels in your format so you do have the consistency once it gets to the manufacturing side, which is the next piece. And really, what we try to do here is to streamline this as much as possible. And the, uh, the way we kind of have this, this set up in our, inside our system is, you know, the first two sides there, the, the stations where you're just kind of scanning the employee ID, uh, identifying who's doing this, again, from an audit trail perspective, uh, scanning what station you're at. And at that point, now you're ready to actually look at production. So you kind of just say, okay, again, think about that parent-child connection, right? You're going to produce a parent, and you're going to consume the children. So what's going to happen is that as you start introducing uh, ingredients to the workstation, then you will scan those ingredients and the item number and the lot numbers. And then you also say what you're producing. And as you produce, you scan each time you're producing an ingredient or an uh, item lot. Now, the nice part about the system is if you're not using serial numbers, you know, where each box or container or batch is uniquely identified, and you're just using lot number, if you think about it, if you were to theoretically have one lot that you're producing for the entire day of whatever item it is, and you're using a single ingredient lot of all the various ingredients, even though there might be multiple containers, you would literally only have like one scan for that whole day. So you would just say, here's what I'm bringing to the, to the actual station. Here are the ingredient lots. Here's the item lot the parent I'm producing, the item number and lot, and you're done. So we try to make this as uh, unobtrusive and, and, and maintain you know, as, as little you know, labor as possible to try to actually work with the system. And so that's kind of our goal. And at the end, once you've gotten to that whole parent-child chain, now as you are going to ship items out, then you just scan, and then that's going to essentially you know, you know, complete that chain that is the top of the line parent and also provides us with that link as to what exactly is going out. So now you can see where you've got the shipping for where the, where the product is going to. You've got the receiving for where the product's coming from, and you've got everything in between in terms of production. So that gives us all the information we need to do the various reporting, which coincidentally is the next slide. And the two main reports are what we call the genealogy or the drill down report. And what happens here is that you get a phone call or some kind of communication that says there's a problem. There's a problem with one of your items that, were, that you shipped out to a customer. And now you're going to start looking and say, OK, I need to quickly be able to identify, given that item and lot that I got the call on, all the various ingredients, components, whatever went into that. And so this is your drill down report. This is where you start your root cause analysis. Now, with all that information that shows all the various items and lots that went into that uh, suspect item and lot, then you can start uh, actually figuring out, OK, where is the problem occurring? And let's say you've done that now. You've gone through the process. You've determined, hey, I've got a specific ingredient lot that was really bad that came from this one supplier. At that point, the magic comes in play. You hit that one button on the where used and up the chain it goes, and you will get a report showing everything that used that particular ingredient lot. And so if it's something that's in process, it's going to stop there. If it's something that goes through a shipper, if it's still on the shelf, if it's gone out to a, a customer, everything will be shown to you in that, in that chain. So you can see here where you, here is the whole beauty of the system is, yeah, you got to collect the data, but ultimately, what in terms of reporting, it's really like a one-button operation. So it's very nice to be able to have that without having to go through the alternative if you're on a manual system, which, of course, is to go through file cabinets and 
receivers and shippers and production control sheets and lot track forms and everything. This could all be done quickly, automatically. Now, let's talk about the planning side because really anybody who's doing software can provide you with some kind of tracking system and anybody can drop up, you know, not say drop up, but let's just say they, they install the software and they train you how to use it and they're done, right? Well, with, with lot traceability, we like to, to think of ourselves as you know, making sure that we understand the steps to success for actually implementing traceability. And so to do that, there are a number of steps that you have to do up front before you can really use the software. And the first step we uh, talk about is defining workstations. So actually being able to walk the process from one end to the other and take a look and say, okay, where are my trigger points? Where are my reporting points? Where do I need to make sure that I have, that I'm going to be actually putting in some kind of collection component? And so the first thing you want to do is define all those stations that are going to be impacted. Even if they're inspection stations, you might have to put something in there. So having those workstations defined, the next thing you look at is for each one of those stations, I have to define the parents and the children. So what material is coming into that station, what material is coming out of that station. And then you start getting into the process of, okay, how do I identify each one of these? Because really for any kind of automated system, the, for, before you can report, you have to be able to collect. And before you collect, you have to be able to identify. So we start looking at, okay, what are the, what are the possibilities? What, what do we do here? Do we put a label on that's something we can label? Is it, uh, if so, is, is it a 1D barcode? Is it a two-dimensional barcode? Is it an RFID tag? Is it a graphic that we need a camera for? Is it a batch process, uh, something that's coming by, you know, that we're pouring, you know, uh, flour into a vat, and we need to identify, you know, through some kind of PLC process what, you know, what's coming through. So having to identify every one of those parents and children is, is, is critical before you can really do anything on the collection side. Because once you've done that, then you're able to say, okay, now, once I know how I'm identifying all these parents and children, what do, how do I identify how to collect them? Okay, what, what is the, uh, what, you know, what's going to be a collection mechanism? Again, am I doing, if I'm using a, a barcode, is it going to be a, a fixed reader? Is it going to be one of those handheld terminals? Is it going to be a PLC, RFID reader? I mean, what, what exactly is going to be involved in terms of collecting it? So it could even be someone typing into a tablet at this point. So, I mean, any, any of the technologies that are available for barcoding the vision are all available for doing that collection. And now you start talking about, okay, well, now I've kind of gone through that process of how do I identify, how do I collect, what rules do I need internally? Because most of the rules are pretty well set. Okay, you, you, the standard ones about, you know, I'm introducing a, an ingredient to a station, I'm creating this item coming out of it. But what happens when you're talking about mixed lots? And meaning that now you've got a situation where you have, a, 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 let's say, a different lot of a certain ingredient you're introducing to the process. If you're talking about going to a station, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, you just record it, and now you've got that lot in there until the other one, you know, used up, and then then now you start carrying the new one forward, and everything seems pretty straightforward. However, especially in food, this is pretty. This is this is not as easy as it sounds because in many cases, you're putting in some kind of ingredient, like an unusual example of flour. Okay, so as the vat gets low gets low, you're adding more flour onto the top. Now, it's all getting mixed together. So then the question is, at what point do you know? How do you know exactly when the older lot is totally used up? Because that's going to obviously affect your recall at the other end. So having that conversation, having those as an agreement on, on those rules is important. What about in your in your uh, reusability and in, in rework? Okay, we did a, a another project with Rayco with a sausage manufacturer where they basically you know did the whole mixing and put all the in ingredients together and went to the sausage forming machine and when everything came out on the other end, uh, if the sausage was wasn't formed properly, then they just took it, threw it in a wheelbarrow, and dumped it back into the grinder again. Well, when do we know that that is completely used up? 
So all these mixed lot rules are, are, are very important to have to discuss. Then you have to look at, okay, what additional data? Okay, you got your basic data, you know, you got your item number, you got your lot number, maybe you're, you know, creating some kind of serialization, license plating, different containers. So you know you've got some real basic there, but what about the other information? What if there is additional quality information? If there's additional uh, information about, you know, you're trying to keep quantities and you know, to try to maintain some kind of inventory control. Um, you know, and uh, just, you know, what other information are you trying to capture, machine data and things like that. So you have to kind of look at everything that you need so it isn't making sure you don't leave anything out. So when you get to the point where you are collecting that information, you're not missing anything critical. And assuming that you're going to be using some kind of label, well, okay, uh, most, most of our customers have something. They have, they have some kind of label, paper label, the tag that actually has some kind of information on it. Well, is it going to be consistent? Is it going to be the same label for receiving as it is for production through the, your working process and finished good and shipping? Or is it going to be different labels? Are you going to, are you going to look at one label maybe you're going to have for receiving because of some information that's maintained on that label, but then production doesn't really need very much? Uh, and then, of course, you have your shipping, which may be more customer specific. So sitting down and working through that process is very critical because part of the system is producing labels. And if that's something that's going to be required, then you need to know what those labels are going to look like, what information is going to be on them, and where it's coming from. Then, of course, you got through all these rules, and you go, yeah, I've got all these rules except. And now you look at where are the exceptions, because every time you turn around in any kind of uh, manufacturing distribution environment, there are always some exceptions, and you have to be able to define those up front. So again, when the system comes in, that is going to be installed and it starts running. That's not the time to find out that it works for 80 or 90 percent of the situations, except for these other scenarios. And you have to understand what those are and make sure you you know how you're going to deal with them. And then last is really the additional functionality because you've got a system that you're going to be doing all the scanning with and all this data collection. Well, what else do you want to do with it? Do you want to do some kind of inventory control? Do you want to try to add some warehousing type functionality onto it? Uh, you know, do you want to do some kind of quality control data? So again, you look and say, well, maybe I can, if I'm already going to be doing this, uh, if I'm going to be feeding information to my business ERP system, then I need to be able to define that up front. So, this is what we see as a process that, as you can see, goes beyond just buying the software and installing it on some server somewhere and, and saying, okay, ready to go. So that is it for the planning side, and that is actually it for the presentation. And at this point, um, we're going to open the floor to questions. And we do have lots of great questions coming in. Uh, what operating system options are available for running this application is the first one. Uh, basically, uh, I mentioned we're, we're a Microsoft shop. Uh, everything we do is under the Windows environment. Uh, we are certainly uh, internet friendly in terms of being able to host data, get to data you know, through the internet. But uh, but there is a um, uh, there there is going to be a Windows component to to actually running the the, the base system and the and the various collection mechanisms. Does the software integrate with an Oracle R12? Uh, actually, we've done that before with, with this system. We actually have a, a customer, manufacturing customer, that is running Oracle, and we are interfacing with it. Um, because we are the for IT folks out there, we are Microsoft uh, SQL Server based, so we do have the ability to talk with any type of other database through an ODBC connectivity, and uh, basically uh, Oracle happens to be one of the easier ones to work with, but we've also interfaced with uh, other databases like Progress and, and, and different ones, but especially on the uh, AS400 side as well, iSeries. So yeah, we certainly can integrate with Oracle as one of the, I would call it the easier, more SQL-based type systems. Uh, speaking of integration, can the software uh, work with or talk to QuickBooks or other accounting software? Uh, in terms of the accounting side, there's, it's really kind of, um, I guess it's one of those things I probably would need to deal with on, on a, like more of a detailed basis with somebody who was looking to do that. Uh, the, 
the information that we are tracking is, is typically not financial. So if you're talking about trying to just interface as far as like inventory, the idea that if we're reporting production, can we uh, update you know quantities of a specific part number in an accounting system? Yeah, we can certainly do that. Uh, in terms of QuickBooks specifically, uh, we haven't done that one before. We, we looked into it uh, one time and it was uh, fairly involved for, you know, you had to really, you know, become certified in QuickBooks and get all kinds of integration training. So in situations like that where we don't have the in-house expertise to do that integration, we would look to our customer or some other consultant that they might uh, contract with that would help us uh, develop those kind of interfaces. But again, from the Microsoft side, we do have the ability to tie, tie in just about anything. I, I, I haven't come on anything yet. Even at one point, we tied in with a Xerox mainframe, which was running <laughs> some a very, very old operating system and database. And we still manage to get data back and forth. So if there's a will, there's a way. We can do it. Hmm. Uh, how do you handle grouping multiple lots on one pallet when, you, uh, when you're shipping, uh, when scanning all the individual cases is not possible? Um, yeah, good question. Uh, I guess the, well, ideally if you are trying to uh, maintain some kind of, well, in, in terms of the parent-child connection, if you are going to put something on a pallet, if you want a master label, then you're going to have to have some, you have to, you have to do some kind of collection, whether it's a scan or whether someone's going to enter the information in uh, to a screen, then there has to be some kind of tie-in between the master label and, and the actual child label that would be on each one of the containers. So if you don't want to go through all that scanning from a manual process, one way of doing it, of course, would be if you had the ability to put it on an automated conveyor and actually put a, a fixed scanner there. Uh, another way would be using RFID. But you know, ideally, if you had a situation where, let's say, you had you know, 50 containers on a pallet and they were all like one item lot number, for example, then you can actually just scan one of those labels and then say, I've got 50. Okay, so it's, it's not like we're going to force you to, to do it a certain way, but that's one of those implementation types questions where we have to look at the specific situation and say, okay, what's the best way that we can work with you to minimize the amount of labor overhead, uh, but at the same time get to our goal of creating that parent-child connection. Have you ever used Toolworks in conjunction with a warehouse equipped with voice technology? Uh, yeah, actually, well, we, we haven't done that in terms of an actual implementation. I couldn't take you to an actual customer. Uh, we, we have found that usually in the, in the voice applications that they tend to be more focused on the warehousing side. So you're, you're picking and you're, you're shipping processes. Um, that you know, where where someone or put away and move. I mean, some, something where it's, it's more of a warehouse inventory kind of scenario. We haven't seen it as much on the production side, and certainly not in the, in the lot traceability side. But um, you know, certainly if there was a, I you mean, know, we we know with some of the main systems like Vote Collect and stuff that you know how we know that there are integration points that we can work with. So we just haven't had any customer requests to do that. So we really haven't spent the time to, to pull it together and, and, and be able to demo it, uh, but we're certainly open if someone has that kind of requirement that we can certainly work with them and, again, to find those integration points and, and make sure that we're tying it together properly. Can lot traceability be used to track production aging, for example, to allow FIFO shipping? And uh, there's a follow-up question, does each lot create a unique inventory location? So uh, I guess let's uh, talk about the, uh, the production aging part first. Yeah, part of the error proofing side, which we could put into place, is let's say you've got a uh, if you if you want the system to do this, then right now the uh, uh, the default would be that you know as long as you are uh, if you've got a bill of material uh, recipe for a specific workstation, then we're going to error proof and make sure that if it calls for you know three different ingredients, you've got to pull a lot of each one of those ingredients. When if you put up, put, you know, actually pull the wrong uh, wrong item number and you try to bring it to the process, we're going to flag that. So, 
So we've got that in place. In terms of the lot, the FIFO scenario, yeah, we've, we've done that before where as long as we know that we've got that inventory control part of it, meaning that we know what is the oldest lot number that is out there. Now, this is going to involve you know, a little more warehousing, right? Like we talked about additional functionality uh, where we've got to now track, okay, how much of this particular lot number one is actually an inventory so that when, they, when someone brings lot number two to the cell, that we know that there are no more lot number ones, that lot number two is okay. And if there still is lot number one out there, we need to say, no, I'm sorry, it's going to be a warning or a hard error that says, hey, you didn't pull the latest lot, uh, so or, or the oldest lot. So, so we can set that up, but it, it does involve giving us a little more control or at least integration with something that's already exists to tell us you know, specifically what lots and quantities are actually out there so we don't... Uh, uh, so, so we're able to, to basically give the right information to the operator. And uh, the other question about uh, does each lot create a unique inventory location? Uh, we don't do anything really with locations in terms of a lot track. It's not. It, it's really that again that parent-child connection. So what you're going to see is there's going to be a chain uh, of records that we're that we're showing in each one of these transactions. And so at the point when you produce a parent then uh, you know, that's going to be that, you know, the key, again, is that item lot number is, is really the, the two major fields there. If, it is, if, if again, you want to try to put location tracking in there, we can do that, and there can be an actual uh, you know, part of the prompt can be for a location where that, in, where that item is actually being stored. But we don't actually create any kind of locations. It, it's just, again, part of the parent-child chain. Can the system import bills and materials so that the user can scan lots against the required components? Yes, and I was kind of talking about, about you know, just before in the error proofing, yes, absolutely. Uh, we, we've got these various master files, the, the, the part master, you know, item master, the employee master, the station master, the, uh, you know, the, the bill of material, recipes, whatever you want to call it, and yes, all that information can be imported in. And again, when something, when you're actually going to produce something, the first thing it does is the system will do is go to that bill of material for that item, and then it will start looking for those particular items. So it, it will actually do the error proofing, and all that can be imported from either another business system, or or you can just put you know put a spreadsheet together and just you know we we can import right from the spreadsheet. So uh, which which our way works for you. Are you able to pull up a production schedule to select the item that needs to be reported against? Uh, again, under the additional functionality column, I guess you could say sure. Uh, we certainly can. I mean, typically customers are working with some kind of router, traveler, work order, uh, something that the operator has already, and they add a barcode to that. And so, uh, so that becomes kind of their setup process, and so they can scan that as part of the setup to say, okay, I'm actually going to, I'm working on this part number. I'm going, to, I'm going to scan this part number, and then everything kind of falls, follows from there. Um, can we actually access the production schedule? Yes, uh, that, but we'd have to have some, kind, we'd have to have some idea of knowing, okay, uh, the production schedule would probably have to obviously be automated, something, something electronic, and be accessible through a key, mainly the workstation, because really at that point, that's all we would have. Uh, that to know we know the operator, we know the workstation, so we'd have to do some kind of lookup and say, okay, in this table, what is out, out, out there for this workstation? At that point, we can grab that part number and then start prompting from there. So certainly it can be done. Uh, it just depends on, you know, again, having the right information available. And it looks like we got one more question. This looks like a good one to end on. Uh, lot tracking and traceability as a specialty has existed for a number of years in the manufacturing space, especially for safety-related items. What sets Toolworks solutions apart from others who provide barcode or RFID traceability systems? Uh, interesting. Um, well, I guess what, we, what we've really seen, I guess really it's more of a marketplace kind of question, what, what we've really seen out there is that a, when, when you when you Google lot track or lot traceability, you, you end up pulling up a lot of different ERP systems websites because you know your your various SAPs and Oracles and QADs of the world uh, are all you know putting in lot track lot trace type functionality, some kind of screen, typically in the production reporting side, where on on 
in addition to reporting the part number and station and quantity, you're also putting in things like you know what component lots and what lot did you produce and things like that. Um, and so uh, what we <laughs> we kind of found is that of course what that leaves off is everything else, right? I mean, all the identification process, all the collection process. I mean, this is this is all based on assuming that there's you know that there's somebody right there who who has that information can key it all into the system. Even if they offer a mobile component to their uh, to, you know from a data collection side into their into their business system, you know there, there's still going to be you know, a, a lot of information. A lot of our customers really like the idea of having a standalone system for the traceability for building that parent-child chain. And so, especially if you start getting into any kind of serialization, where the amount of information you can imagine, like, what if you're putting serialized parts and starting to try to capture, you know, individual parts, serial numbers? I mean, the, the volume of information that'd be going into an ERP system would be overwhelming and really extraneous. Most business systems, they just want to know, yeah, I ran today on this machine and I produced this many parts. And that's really what they, what they want to know. A lot of them even just do back flushing. So it, it does, in, in many cases, traceability doesn't even enter into the picture. So we, we find that from, you know, from, the, from the business system side, you know, it, it's, a lot, it's a lot better in many cases to just have this as kind of an external. And then, of course, we can always just integrate that data back in. We can do that summarization and send it up to the business system. So that's kind of our take on, on where the whole lot track you know, traceability system falls into play. And we can play well with others and, um, and certainly uh, you know, provide the best of both worlds for people. If you'd like more information on lot traceability and protecting yourself in the event of a recall, there's Ed and Larry's direct lines right there. Or please feel free to contact a RICO product specialist at 1-800-446-1991. Thank you all and have a great day.